Hey, buddy, welcome back to another episode of uh, Rethink. I've got a good friend, uh, Jason Martinkus, here. Um, really excited about what's going to happen in, uh, in the next few weeks. Uh, we have the Rocky Mountain Men's Summit coming up, and you're going to be one of our featured teachers at that. Um, uh, tell us a little bit what, what you do, Jason. I know, and a lot of the guys know, but yeah. tell us what you do right now, and then i got some leading questions to that, then I'm going to turn you loose. Sure. Yeah, we uh, run a, a coaching practice called Redemptive Living where we help people across the world who are struggling with sexual integrity issues and broken marriages because of those sexual integrity issues. Yeah. So we help we help men struggling. We help wives who are going through on the other side being betrayed, and we help marriages find restoration and redemption. Yeah. I, I think that you kind of first came on my radar. I don't know. It's early in my ministry here, and we had a small staff, and we had a, we had a staff marriage retreat, and you and Shelly came and spoke at it. Yeah. And you began to share your story and Shelly's story, and... Like, I knew Flatirons was raw and real, but I was just sitting there going, ha, ha, right? I took my breath because, like, in church world, um, like, one is you don't share that story, and you certainly don't come back from that story. And I want to I hear that story a little bit, but yeah. I, I have a feeling that that's what got you into the line of work that you're, you're doing. You're, you serve as an elder here, you know, currently. Yeah. Um, I've experienced you coming in from a long day of looking into the darkest spots in in a in a in a man's life that like anything but that right and you spend a whole day doing that mm-hmm. and then you come in here and and it's weighing on you right it's weighing on you and i'm like why why do you want to do that i made the joke earlier it's like it's like being a proctologist i mean <laughs> there's a lot of parts of the body that are much better more than, appealing than that. more appealing than that but so and maybe that's all one question. Why do you do this? And uh, we want to get to know you a little bit because I think some men that are going to go to the to the summit are going to listen to this and go, what I did, because after I kind of got into my junk, there's one person I wanted to talk to, and that was you, Yeah. right? And I just vomited everything, and you really could trust you. So, so you. why do you do this, and yeah. how did you get into it? And go upstream as far as you want, and I'm going to do my best to... To, to listen because this story is just it's a it's redemptive right it is it is thank the lord um yeah, yeah so uh without trying to give too many details and be you know too long-winded um as a kid you know uh, as an adolescent i was introduced to pornography hardcore pornography um discovered everything that went along with that and uh back in the early computer days some some people are listening to remember commodore 64 computers Ooh way back in the day um but my pornography was national geographic (laughs) right okay sears catalog is that yeah yeah um uh so early pornography early brokenness around sexuality um uh and and i just say you know my story includes you know pornography masturbation sex with animals inanimate objects you know you you name it right multiple affairs the whole nine yards um but but the the longer version is there was early brokenness in my sexuality, um, sexually active through teenage years, and then went into marriage really thinking that that marriage would fix it. Right, right. I get married, and then everybody knows it's all the sex you want all the time, and it's forever. Like Care bears and rainbows, right? So, <laughs> um, and so I graduated from college, got married, and it was just uh, it was a nightmare. Yeah. It was a nightmare. It was um, a consistent theme at that point of uh, sexual addiction. I mean, I, I was full court press addicted. Like, I couldn't stop. I tried to stop. I did different things. Well, wait, so so you have, you, have a, you have a beautiful wife, yeah. right? You're freshly married. Yeah. It's, the, it's what every guy wants, right? right? And that wasn't enough. Yeah, because it wasn't about sex. It wasn't about sexuality. It was about the brokenness deeper in my heart and soul. Did Shelly see this at all in you? Um, in retrospect, yeah, yeah. Rearview mirror, right? And for so many wives who go through this stuff, you know, it's they look back and they go, "Oh, oh, oh, yeah." Now it all makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, if Shelly were sitting here, she would tell you she should have said no when I proposed. She should have said no, not yet. Um, so she felt something even then. Yeah, mm. yeah. But I always joke, you can't call off a big Texas wedding. We were, it was already. You know, things were already in motion. Um, so uh, early in our marriage, it was just distant, cold, and broken. Like, there were good days and fun, but then there were, like, there, it was hollow. 
What were you doing career-wise then? Uh, I was working in consulting at a company called Arthur Anderson back then. Oh, yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. Um, which I'm terrible with numbers and details and have massive high ADD. So working at an accounting firm <laughs> didn't go well. Uh, I got fired from there. So, um, Is that before or after Enron? That was after, <laughs> right when Enron was happening, actually. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, actually, I got fired because... I stopped going to work. I would stay in my apartment all day looking at porn and chatting with women online. <laughs> and after you don't show up at the client site days in a row, you get fired. Yeah. Um, and that's why I say it was an addiction at that point because it was taking over my entire life. Wow. I was spending days doing that, nights doing that. Um, kind of the quintessential moment for me and all of that was... Um, I was traveling for work. I was working for a company at that point called Interstate Batteries, which is a fantastic company, great people. I was traveling, and so I would fly into a city. I'd spend the day with a client. Somewhere in the middle of the night, I'd get online. I'd go meet someone from the Internet. I'd walk back into my hotel room at 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning. I'd literally sit down, open my computer, and start again. Hmm. And I would do that for – I would binge for days on end. Um, I was suicidal at that point, almost drove myself There's got to be a wave of shame – just playing all the time? Oh, back then? Back then? Oh, constant. Yeah. Constant. In fact, I told a story recently to someone. I would, uh, it, going down the street or going through a store, I would intentionally avoid looking at the windows or the mirrors. Because mm. I just hated seeing myself in the mirror. Yeah. I hated seeing my own face. Wow. Yeah. Um, so I almost drove my truck off a highway one night in North Dallas, because we lived in Dallas, Texas at the time. And, um, and man, I, uh, I came to a screeching halt in the middle of that interstate, mm. just slamming my fist on the steering wheel going, why can't I stop? Like, mm. I want to stop. I, God feels a million miles away. I prayed a bajillion prayers yeah. and it's radio silence and it just, I was stuck. I just thought the only way out is to die, you know? Um, so for whatever reason, um, God's providence I, I came back from a trip. Uh, I was in Kalamazoo, Michigan, in fact. And I, I, I walked in. Um, Shelly confronted me when I walked in. She said, you know, sit down. I was like, hey, babe. She said, sit down in the chair. You're an effing alien to me. And I'm going, what? And now she starts to go, tell me what's going on with this particular woman. And I'm going, come on, you're crazy. What are you talking about? I don't, you know. And when we went through multiple iterations of me dodging, juking, and jiving, and finally... So how did she find out? How did it get come to light? Um, so uh, this this sounds, you know, I mean, cliche, it's a matter of time, right? Right. It, it sounds cliche, but um, two weeks prior, two weeks prior, I had had a moment where I was standing in the shower. I was reflecting on my life. I was, I eventually landed in the bottom of the shower in tears and soapy water and vomit and was just like, okay, God, you got to show up or I'm going to die. And over the next two weeks, he just laid out a breadcrumb trail for Shelly to find. Random random calls from people. She got prompted to look at cell phone records, credit card receipts. She just started going through. And then ultimately that night when she confronted me, ended with her saying, you know, tell me what went on with this woman. I lied. And she finally said, I spent the last two hours on the phone with her. I know the whole story. Mm-hmm. And slammed the door to our bedroom. And that's where, that was that was the train wreck, right? That was finally coming. And um, so a couple days later, we got in the car to drive and see the pastor that married us. And on this six and a half hour car ride, I told the whole story of everything that had happened from as far back as I could possibly remember. And uh, if Shelly were sitting here, she would tell you it was the absolute worst moment of her life. I can't imagine. And it was the moment that our healing started. Why would you do that? I mean, Man. that's like, do you, you, you have kids at that point? No. Okay. No. So you're risking everything. Yeah. Right. And and you said, I have, and here it came. Right. Yeah. I mean, I I I have a stomachache right now, even imagining that conversation. It's terrible. Yeah. It's terrible. And and the other thing that led to that conversation, and you know, some people listening to this will will relate. You know, I. I lost count. It's hundreds of nights that I laid in bed next to her going, I got to tell her. Mm. I can't tell her. I'm not telling her. 
never tell anybody. And moments in our relationship where Shelly would just randomly on a Saturday afternoon in the car go, hey, are you okay? Is there anything you need to talk to me about? And me sitting there going, nothing. Well, no. No, we're good. But she knew, and I knew, and I knew that she needed to know. I knew that I needed her to know. And then, you know, in, in my head, I'm going, that's ridiculous. There's no way. That's relational suicide. I'm not telling her. Mm-hmm. But I knew. Right? Night after night, I knew. So when we got in the car to drive to Amarillo, Texas, I knew I needed to tell the story finally. Because, you know, there's there's a saying in recovery circles, you're only sick as your secrets. Yeah. I believe that. I mean, I was just, it, it was disease inside me sitting on so many secrets. You know? And when you're talking, at that point, when, when everything finally hit the fan, there was all the pornography, all the online chatting. There were, in the teens of emotional and physical affairs at that point, it had to come out. There's no way to heal without it. She didn't open the door and jump out. <laughs> right. In retrospect, <laughs> looking back, she drove, which I'm like, oh, gosh. why? <laughs> you know? Yeah. But, uh, yeah, it, it was also a place where she needed to know. I mean, there, a little bit of backstory there. Um, nine months prior to all of that, there had been a little bit of a leak of information. She had kind of caught on to something and thought there was something, and I kind of shooed it away. I was like, oh, no, you're crazy and everything, you know, just like you know, we just need to fix our marriage and things will be better. And, you know, um, and so she was super hurt at that point. Um, I was lying about everything, but I gave just enough to get her off my case. Mm -hmm. And what she internalized was I need to change. I need to be sexier, prettier, have more sex, do different things, make our marriage more exciting to make sure that he's happy. So we can be happy. Mm -hmm. And I also have to somehow forgive that there's some kind of pain and that I've been hurt Mm. that Jason almost cheated on me, which was the story that I told her. And so she spent this nine month period really trying to figure out what it meant to change her and change us and forgive. And when we got in the car that day, you know, what she would tell you now is she had to know what she was even trying to forgive me for. She couldn't round the corner on forgiveness because she just didn't know. That was that was a big piece for her. But she was expecting a, a ten, and you gave her a thousand. Sure. All right. So, I think there's some of us that think I would never want to hurt my wife like that. So I'll just go to my grave with it. Go to my grave with it. Okay. Yeah. Does that work? Never. I've never seen it work. Never seen it work. But it, it comes from. Is is that cowardice or is it really? I don't want to devastate her. Uh, I, I don't think it's cowardice. I think there's sincerity and genuineness in wanting to protect our wives. Yeah. It's just misinformed. Yeah. It's mis- and it's also, so I'll get on a soapbox here for a second. It's also a disservice to that guy, to that man, because you can, you'll never really be free. Right. You'll never be able to live into who God is calling you to be when you've got this suitcase full of secrets that you're dragging around everywhere. Yeah, so talk about that. So how do you get from that to freedom? Because it just sounds like you don't come back from that, but you you say it's possible. 100% possible. Because you've, again, we talked about you look at the darkest stories that I can imagine, but you have also have a ringside seat to some of the most redemptive healing stories as well. So how do you get from that car ride to you and Shelly doing ministry together, having mm-hmm. a, a marriage, having three boys together and, and, and you're free from that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. How, what's that path? First of all, I think it's probably, it's not a short path. No, I, um, so, so I'll tell this, the segment of the story. W- once everything hit and came out, then we started to get help. We got plugged in with, with some really good men. Uh, I got plugged into counseling. I got plugged into a group. I, I started to get reconnected with God. I, the, the change process started right at that point. And uh, a few years into that felt called to tell our story to some people. Those people then turned around and said, wow, I need help too. And so started meeting with some people, started doing lay ministry, if you will, and then felt like God was going, this is, this is where you're headed. 
so transitioned from there back to school to get a grad to grad school to, to get a degree in counseling and um and so fast forward blah, 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 right by by the grace of god next month is 19 years mm. that's awesome from all of that oh um, that still gets you i'm just really thankful yeah there's 19 years no no pornography masturbation physical emotional affairs for the last 19 years that's awesome um and sweetness relationally that I just didn't know was possible. I just didn't believe was possible. Um, levels and layers of intimacy in our relationship with Shelly and I, but also, you know, with other men that I just didn't know existed. Yeah, I get that. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, so I, I guess back to your original question, doing what we do today felt like a call, but it also felt like, this our redemption story can't be for not can't be for can't be wasted right right like people people need help people want help we want to help if people need it yeah i I taught that a few weeks ago from stage is the thing that you're most ashamed of like our biggest regret big way that that probably is the thing that god's going to leverage i mean robin's bipolar we didn't vote for that. We, if right. we got a do over, we probably wouldn't ask for that again. Right. But God has leveraged it in ways that are just, just phenomenal. So yeah. I remember, um, I sent a couple to you and I'll leave this really, really vague who had blown up. Right. And they worked through their stuff. Okay. But I remember even a year later, two years later, whenever he was five, 10 minutes late getting home from wherever he's supposed to be, she would almost vomit mm-hmm. because the PTSD of that, right? right? How long, how long, and you can't speak for Shelly, I wish she was here. Uh, how long before she started trusting you again? Um, that's, that's a good question. Uh, trust, good, I have a follow-up too. Trust in our relationship is different today than what we would have originally said trust was. Talk about that. Right? So trust... I've always wanted to say that to a counselor. Right. Talk, talk, talk about talk that. About that. <laughs> um, uh, so, so trust, what we originally understood trust to be was a naive kind of blind thing. There was a naivety of trust meant I, there's no chance that you'll hurt me, especially in this way. Trust today, if Shelly were sitting here, trust today, she she would say, I trust him. I just know that he's not above bad things on good days. Ooh, that right. should be on a T-shirt. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's really good. Print that. Um, yeah. She she just knows, like, he's capable of hurting me again. And and she would say, I'm capable of hurting him just the same. Mm-hmm. Right? We, the, the ground is level at the foot of the cross, right? It's <laughs> for, like, for better or worse. Right? Yeah. So, so trust today... It, you know, it's it's ebbed and flowed in our relationship to where uh, I, this is a telling moment. I was out of town at an event that I was speaking at. This is probably eight years into our process. I was out of town at an event, and I picked the phone, called Shelly. I'm like, hey, da 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 this is what's going on. She's like, by the way, where are you? I'm like, oh, I'm at the hotel. She's like, no, what city are you in? I go, what? you don't know what city I'm in? She says, no, I don't remember. Where are you? And there was this moment where we both kind of went, "You trust me. <laughs> you don't even you, you don't even need to know what city I'm in anymore." Mm. You know, and it was it was a, a profound place where it didn't have all the anxiety, it didn't have all the make sure that if you're not you know five minutes late, then I'm going to panic. All that stuff was gone, right? But that was eight years in. Yeah, that. So it's you can be hurt secondhand. You can't forgive secondhand right Ooh. it's like you that this is going to take a while it's going to take a while and another one of those soapbox things for me because of the work that we do um like we we don't have a real good theology on slow miracles we don't we don't preach that very often like you don't hear the message on the 27 year miracle mm-hmm. right when people hear a miracle they hear redemption they hear god does these things and they think instantaneous yeah that's good Right? As opposed to like, no, you're in the middle of a 10-year miracle. Yeah. And five and a half years into that, still going to be really messy. Right. Still going to be painful. That's good. It's not all bad. It, there are more good days than bad. Hmm. But it, it, this isn't 
open and close. No, that, that's great. The, the miracles you hear about in the Bible are his leg didn't work and then it worked. His eyes didn't work and then they worked. Okay, you don't ever see. It. And then Jesus touched him and he was never angry again. Totally right. He it's was never like, full of bitterness again. He never dealt with lust again. Right. Character issues. Yeah. Right. Aren't instantaneously right. fixed. You can cut out your eye and gout, gout, cut off your hand, gouge out your eye. It's not going to cure your lust. That's right. That's going to take more. Right. That's that's deeper work. Okay. Here's your so follow up question. We'll okay. wrap this up. Right. Now your session is going to be full. Nobody's going to come here anymore. Right. Session, but, <laughs> that's not true. Uh, Two years ago, I sat down with you and asked you about coming on board as an elder, which I would put myself under your authority, yeah. right, as a board of elders. Uh, like, it's like God owns his church, and then he empowers the elders who empower me, and I oversee the staff and the teaching here, right? Do you, do you remember what your response was when I asked you to consider this? I do. Here. Do, okay. All right? Fill me in. We're at a barbecue <laughs> restaurant downtown, and you went... Jim, I'm a former serial adulterer. How can I be an elder? Right? Yeah. So, but you are. Yeah. All right? So how how does, I mean, this story continues to play. Mm -hmm. So uh, how can such a, I don't know the right word, dark past, it's not forgotten. It's always be there, right? It's right. forgiven. All right, but it's it's like you can't like that didn't happen. It did happen, right? But now you're one of the leaders of this church, all right. And to me, this redemption is you and Shelly, you and your kids, and I assume you have three boys. Someday there's going to be a really like camp out. Well, we're we're already having those. Let me really, tell you. right, yeah. right. So I feel sorry those boys. They're not going to get anything over on you, right? Right. <laughs> how how would how would you explain this from where you were a serial, you know, sexual brokenness, right? To one of the leaders at Flatirons, right? And my leader, right? How do you explain that? I mean, when you, when you, when you frame it like that, you know, I just kind of look like, who's he talking about? You yeah. know? Yeah. Um, at the end, again, I don't want to sound trite or cliche, but at the end of the day, God is in the business of redemption. Yeah. Right? Like, uh, what you you see over and over again stories in the Bible that God just uses willing people, mm -hmm. willing to take a next step, mm -hmm. willing to have a next hard conversation, willing to admit the next hard thing. And I think that's been the journey that we've been on to, to land here is just year after year, month after month, being willing to take the next step that God is putting in front of us. Yeah. Not turning back um, because of community. And, and let me just detour for just a second. I mean, that's, that's the other thing that I think is really important to highlight is I wouldn't be sitting here if I didn't have men in my life who are walking with me. Right. I mean, God, as you said, God's done the deal. God gets the glory. But he's empowered other people. Mm -hmm to do that work boots on the ground and that's ongoing and that's ongoing. Yeah. I, I sit here today with that. Right. I'm so I, I don't want to, I don't want to also paint the picture of like, just trust Jesus and it'll all be glory. Like mm -hmm. it's God and others walking this out in yeah. community yeah. that make it happen. Yeah. It's good. Yeah. Hey, so all of this is why I wanted you to come to the retreat and, and teach. And you just talked about like, what was that car moment? The, that was the explosion moment, or that's the... The, the train wreck? Train wreck. Yeah, you call yeah. it a train wreck, right? Yeah. So the metaphor we're kind of unpacking up there at the retreat was like, hey, I'm trying to aim my life at a bullseye, right? And uh, like intimacy, marriage, yeah. you know, uh, trust, all those things that we want with the most important person in our life. Yeah. And you always get the bullet that hit way over here, ricocheted off, Hit a bunch of innocent, hit a bunch of innocent people, stuff like that. Yeah. That's what you end up with. But yeah. really what I want to talk about, not just at the retreat, right, is not just that, but is there anything upstream that you could coach us on to go like your bullet doesn't have to go over there? And it's not the target's fault, and it's not even the gun's fault, right? It's yeah. not your body, right? It's like, yeah. it's like it's, it's, there's an operator error that we have to be aware of. And, and too many of us... I think we have an internal conversation in our head going, that'll never happen to me. 
or two. I did it, but I can, I'll go to the grave with it, and it won't matter. Or I don't want to hurt anybody else, and so I can fix myself. And and none, none of that works. And so I'm looking forward to hearing you uh, up at the at the men's summit just unpack what I would say most of us it terrifies us. Yeah. Yeah. And it doesn't have to. It doesn't have to. It doesn't have to. I, I think that maybe terrify is not the right word. It's like the stakes are so high if I get this wrong. Yeah. And that's it. Like I I came back from sabbatical going, at the end of the day, this this place is not my identity. Nickels and noses, size of the church, right? Pastor Jim's not my right. It's Jesus and Robin. And I better have those figured out because yeah. at the end of the day, that's all I got. Yeah, totally. Right? You know, I, I think sometimes what you were saying, saying just a second ago, the stakes are so high. The uh, the consequence, the fallout is is so, so heavy. Mm-hmm. Right? Um, but I will say, I think sometimes we undersell how so many people in our world are actually pulling for our own redemption. So many times, if if you sit in my office for a day and you hear the stories of brokenness, you'll hear wife after wife go, just be honest because I know you're a good man. We can get there. Just be honest. Let's let's work through this. We can get there. I mean, we hear it over and over. The, you know, adult kids, dad, just, just lean into this. Just walk through this. We want this for you. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think, I think we undersell that outside of us. Sometimes we just make up the stories about how it's going to go. Oh, definitely. Sometimes based on our reality of what we saw when we were young. Yeah. But I want to encourage people like there's probably a lot more people, maybe even that share your last name that are pulling for your redemption as opposed to looking for your destruction. Good. Can't wait. Let's go. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you.